In this lecture, we're looking at the fallout of Nicaea and the ongoing controversies surrounding the relationship of the father and the son. And we can begin by a quick recap of what happened at the Council of Nicaea. Arianism, following from this originist tradition, down through Lucian of Antioch and into the person of Arius, had argued that the son and the father were not the same being. Rather, Arianism attempted to connect father and son through a unity of something else. They believed that they were protecting the absolute identity of the father as the source or as God, and somewhat to avoid the simple heresy of Sibelianism or modalism, Arianism had sought instead to make the son a creature. Now, in the end, the decision of Nicaea rested both on the biblical reflections on the subject of the son's identity to the father. And we've stressed this again and again, but we'll do it here one more time. The Bible does invite a conversation or a reflection on the relationship of the father and the son. It's on Jesus' lips that he and the father are one, and yet there is some clear distinction between he and the father that, in a very simplistic way, means he can refer to the Father as somehow different from himself. Well, after the fallout of Nicaea, several things were in the context of the church at this time. Arius and a couple of his followers, of course, had been exiled, but that didn't mean that everyone themselves, who had at least some sympathy with the arguments of Arianism, were gone as well. Take, for example, the person of Eusebius of Caesarea. Eusebius is an important figure, well known for his history of the ancient church, as well as for his panegyrics or his somewhat rose-tinted picture of Constantine's rule. Well, Eusebius is something of a microcosm of the middle ground position after Nicaea. Eusebius had signed the creed after Nicaea, though he had some hesitations. One of the issues with the use of homoousios to describe the relationship of father and son is simply the fact that it could be leveraged or pressed into a Sabalian or modalistic mode. If the father and the son are identical essences, well, to some, people like Eusebius, they worried pretty significantly that this sounded like Sabalianism. Or, perhaps another way of putting it, they realized that it lacked clarity on Sabalianism, which had been condemned earlier, in an effort to condemn Arianism, the new heresy. Eusebius actually felt that Athanasius and some of his writings on Arianism that came out after Nicaea bordered on a modalistic perspective. So committed was Athanasius, he felt, to this idea of the ultimate unity of father and son that Eusebius questioned whether or not this was a bit too extreme. And again, this is something of a microcosm of how a number of people felt in positions of power, in particular the bishops around the Christian world. And what happens after Nicaea in terms of categories is we can identify roughly four general groups. Now, these are idealized groups that historians categorize. No one would have considered themselves to be one of these groups per se. They didn't make t-shirts, for example. But the four groups are named the Old Nicaeans, the New Nicaeans, a group that we've looked at in other lectures called Semi-Arianism, and, not surprisingly, a group called the Radical Arians. Now, one more time, these are historians' categories. But the reason historians categorize these four groups is that they all have a certain impulse or an instinct when it comes to how they're going to take the Nicene Creed in its original form. The old Nicaeans are people like Athanasius, as well as another man by the name of Eustathius. Not long after the Council of Nicaea, Athanasius takes the bishopric of Alexandria after Alexander passes, and Eustathius becomes the bishop of Antioch. And they are roughly of the same position, which we call the Old Nicaeans. And that is, these are the people that are staunchly committed to the concept and the usage of the phrase homoousios. They believe that Arianism is more of a threat to the understanding of the biblical teaching that Christ came down as God, fully God, in order to redeem us. They did not feel any pressure or any concern that they were slipping in modalism. In fact, they denied this pretty extensively. So there's this old Nicene group 
who are staunchly committed to homo usias. There are folks, though, who we call the new Nicaeans, and these are the folks who, generally speaking, are both concerned about Arianism. They're not at all happy with Arianism. But they're also not necessarily happy with the way homo usias could slide into a modalistic perspective. And historians note that new Nicaeans like to use a phrase, homoios kat usias, which probably should translate to mean that father and son are exactly similar. Now, in English, those two words are a bit vague. Exactly similar is almost something of a contradiction. But I think you'll see how this fits in when we go down the other two as well. Because the semi-Aryans taught a position that historians note as being homoios kat energeian, which we can translate as merely similar or barely similar or something like this. And not surprisingly, on the bottom there, radical Aryans are entirely opposed to any relationship of father and son. And historians note the usage of the word anomoias, which is a real radical distinction between father and son in terms of their being. While the old Nicaeans and the radical Aryans, we can understand. They have a strong distinction between the two. The distinction we really need to wrestle with is the distinction between the new Nicaeans and semi-Aryans. In a manner of speaking, they form a bit of a perspective, a shading between the old Nicaeans and the radical Aryans. And to go ahead and give you the punchline now, eventually the new Nicaeans come to the conclusion with the old Nicaeans that they're saying essentially the same thing. The old Nicaeans eventually will concede that the new Nicaeans are not being radical or dismissive or subversive with their language. They somewhat concede the point that the new Nicaeans should be a little bit concerned about Sabellianism. But for now, there is a lack of clarity shortly after the Council of Nicaea. The semi-Aryans, though, tend to fall or trend towards a more Aryan perspective. These are the folks who believe that they can create some sort of real gradation between God the Father and God the Son. They believe that they're leaving the Son on the side of divinity, not on the side of creation like Arianism does. But their language was more qualifying, less concerned with relating the Father to Son. In other words, the semi-Arians don't feel the sting that the majority of the bishops did at the Council of Nicaea that if you lower the divinity of the Son, if you distance him far enough from the Father with your language, with your summation of your position on the views of the relationship between Father and Son, that what you're doing is potentially putting in jeopardy salvation. The old Nicaeans and the new Nicaeans are both committed to retaining the idea that God himself came in the person of Jesus to save. They're just squabbling a little bit, or at least differing a little bit, as to the type of language they're going to use to relate father and son. The semi-Aryans are a bit more of the -the on-the-fence folks, from my perspective. Now, that's the category, and that's really the tone and the sense within those who are leading the church after the Council of Nicaea. Constantine, by and large, simply stands back and doesn't get involved very much anymore. And this is to be expected, because Constantine actually dies shortly after the Council of Nicaea in 337. But to the day he died, Constantine believed that the original Nicene Creed was in effect. And this is important because so much of the popular understanding of Constantine is that he somehow either accepted or pressed the Nicene Creed into existence and then spent years undermining it, undermining it, and undermining it. But as we'll see as we tell the story after the Council of Nicaea, Constantine believes that the Nicene Creed is sufficient. And what happens is He gets led down the primrose path with a few voices into believing that some of the old Nicaeans were being a bit too harsh in their idea of the subscription to the council. And so what he does is not so much soften the Nicene Creed, but rather he softens just how far one has to affirm the creed in order to be acceptable. And we'll see this as we go through it. Well, the story's main players are people we've already mentioned, Athanasius, who takes over the Bishopric of Alexandria, Eustathius, who becomes the Bishop of Antioch. Now, as sort of typical old Nicaeans, Eustathius in particular is a bit of a firebrand when it comes to trying to drive people to be staunch homoousians. 
Eustathius, for example, actually writes against Eusebius of Caesarea, challenging him on his perspective, believing that if he can sort of whip him enough theologically that he can get Eusebius to sort of cave in to the Council of Nicaea and the Homoousian position. Athanasius, too, is a real staunch theologian and a Homoousian, but he is far more capable theologically in his efforts to defend the Homoousian position. And as we'll see throughout this story, it's actually Athanasius who is the principal person who is able to bring both sides together of old and new Nicaeans. It's one of the reasons why Athanasius has gone down in history as the real defender of the Nicene Creed and someone who attacks Arianism. But that simple comment is a bit overstated because by the standards of Nicaea, Arianism had already been defeated. There really was no going back to a staunch radical Arianism within the Constantinian world. Even after Constantine dies and his son comes to the throne in the east and one in the west, it is virtually impossible to become a full Arian and still be acceptable within the norms of the church. Rather, what Athanasius' main focus is, is on wooing the new Nicaeans and on challenging those who are either pretty hard semi-Arians or, as we'll see, people who were simply Arian but hiding it. But initially, it's Eustathius who becomes the object of scorn and attack by the semi-Arians or the Arians. Because into this fray, into the sort of soup of debate, steps another Eusebius, Eusebius of Nicomedia. Now, put this in your notes. Be very careful here. There are two Eusebii at this time. One is Eusebius of Caesarea, the historian. And then there's Eusebius of Nicomedia. Not a few students and even a few professors and scholars have at times crashed and burned and looked like fools, unintentionally, of course, because they confuse these two. Well, there's Eusebius of Nicomedia, and then there's another man by the name of Theodoret. And both of these men do really feel as if Arius has gotten a raw deal here. Eusebius, in particular, is a man that is, at least in the literature of the church's history, often scorned for his political intrigue and his backroom deals in the ways he kind of finagles the situation in order to advance his position. But what happens is shortly after Nicaea, Eusebius and Theodoret travel down to Jerusalem for a trip. And then on the way back up, there is called a Synod of Antioch in 330. And this Synod is called to deliberate on the fight between the positions of Eusebius of Nicomedia and that of Eustathius. And it's vitally important because at this council, the issue of Sabellianism or modalism is cited as the main issue with the Homoousians. Eustathius is actually challenged and alleged to be a Sabellian. This is sort of a typical courtroom tactic. If you're being accused of something, you undermine the witness. And if Eustathius is a Sabellian, well then his charge against the semi-Arians is not to be trusted. Well, we're not quite sure all of the issues here because there is some competing evidence. There are some sources that suggest that the charge of Sabellianism failed and that Eusebius of Nicomedia brings out and presents a young woman who claims that Eustathius had had an illegitimate child with her. There are other sources that don't mention this at all, in particular Athanasius and Chrysostom, both contemporaries at this time, discussing this synod, make no mention whatsoever of this controversy related to a young woman. Whatever the case, the Synod of Alexandria actually banishes Eustathius in 330, probably on the charge of Sabellianism. And again, this is all a microcosm of the fight. The twin pressures of Sabellianism on the one hand and Arianism on the other create a lot of firepower for either side. But even just on a theological position, that really is the primary tension in our language when we describe father and son. We don't want to make it sound like there's just one mushed up God who shows up in three different forms. And we also don't want to make it sound like the other persons of the Trinity, short of the Father, are either created or lesser beings, because that would make them not God, and it would make so much of what we attribute to the Father, to the Son, and to the Spirit blasphemous, and it would also render salvation impossible, because only God can come and save. Well, there's one more little wrinkle here, and that's the Miletian Schism. And this is, again, another little microcosm of the debate that I think helps add some clarity to what's happening here. Miletus of Antioch was a man who was a semi-Arian in general. 
he at least had some qualms about homoousios. Now, it's a bit uncertain actually what he teaches. There are some reports that he preached before Constantine and affirmed homoousios. And usually historians scratch their head about this. How can someone who was accused of Arianism also affirm homoousios? Well, if you look at this sort of scale of the four views, it seems very clear that Miletus is somewhere in the middle and he's oscillating back and forth. He feels convinced probably that he can affirm homoousios in front of Constantine because he has to, frankly. Constantine loves the Nicene Creed. But in his private speech, or at least when he's back in Antioch, he would nuance that, let's say. Well, Miletus is banished, and this is a bit of a strange mix because he's banished, and the schism is that there are people in Antioch who essentially break with the church due to what they feel is harsh treatment of Miletus through his banishment. And with Miletus off on the distance, those who are left behind, the schismatics, trend more and more towards the teachings of Eusebius of Nicomedia, meaning they trend more towards the Arian side. Which is probably an indication, again, that they're right there in the middle. They're probably of the category of the semi-Arians. And through a series of debates or conversations, they fall more and more towards the Arian side. Again, this is why it helps to see the four views as a sliding scale and not four compartments. Well, the Miletian schism is important in just a minute, so put that on the back shelf. What happens before Constantine dies is usually misunderstood, but it's something that's very important, and that is the restoration of Arius and his return from banishment by Constantine. Eusebius of Nicomedia had gone back to Constantine and argued that Eusebius had gotten a raw deal and that he was now ready to play nice. Now, we're not quite sure of everything Constantine says here. In one report, it is said that Eusebius prevails on Constantine because he tells him that Arius is willing to accept the Nicene Creed sufficiently. And at least according to one report, Constantine says that, quote, if Arius signs the decree of the Synod, which means the Council of Nicaea, and believes the same, I am ready to see him and to send him back with honors to Alexandria. And so, over a period of time, Eusebius of Nicomedia prevails, and Arius is invited back. And eventually he does come back. He has an audience with Constantine, and according to the reports, Constantine asks if they now accept Nicaea. What is telling here is that they actually say yes. That's often overlooked. This idea that Constantine brings Arius back is often cited as Constantine drifting towards Arianism. Well, actually, what Constantine believes he's done, typical for his ego, is that he has won Arius back through the sheer might of his awesomeness. Well, Arius says yes, and Constantine demands that he write out what he actually believes. And according to Socrates, not the Platonic Socrates from the pre-Christian world, but a later historian, Arius wrote down a creed that goes as follows. Quote, And we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, his Son, God the Word, sprung from him before all time, and by whom all things were created in heaven and earth. Now, we're not sure if this is actually what Arius says or what Arius submits to Constantine, but let's assume for right now that it is. What's telling about this is that they actually left off any language of how the Son is connected to the Father. Instead, this is just simply a naked assertion. They believe in Jesus Christ sprung from him before all time. They do refer to him as God the Word, which is telling. That is a concession, frankly speaking, from Arius. But what Arius does not affirm is homoousios. Well, at the end of it, Constantine is convinced by Eusebius of Nicomedia that this is sufficient. Because Athanasius at this point is really sort of dug in. He doesn't want to concede that Arius has said enough. He wants to actually hear that Arius has something to say about how the father and son relate. Because it's not enough just to say Jesus is God. And this is not Athanasius quibbling here. As he says in his On the Incarnation of Christ and on his book later against the Arians, this is preeminently important for salvation. The Bible gives us language of the Son and the Father. The Bible discusses Son and the Father. And now that the church has given us some language to work with, simply avoiding that language is problematic. Not because Arius is some kind of demoniac who is unable to listen to reason or needs to affirm homoousios at the sake of his faith per se, but rather he's a teacher, he's a voice, 
And what we say about God is important, Athanasius will say. And being rebellious and simply undermining the church is simply not going to stand. Well, again, in the end, Eusebius of Nicomedia convinces Constantine that this is enough. And because Athanasius has dug in, Constantine now gets a bit frustrated with Athanasius. Now it's the homoousians who begin to look like recalcitrant, divisive people. Arius has conceded. He says that Jesus is God. He says he affirms Nicaea. And so what's the big deal there, Athanasius? Why are you digging in? Well, very importantly, in 335, there was a synod of Jerusalem. And in comes stage left the Miletians again, those people who were involved with the Miletian schism who had drifted towards the teachings of Eusebius of Nicomedia. The Miletians come in and actually make a great deal of accusations against people like Athanasius and others. Three of the Miletians charge in a somewhat funny way that Athanasius should be reprimanded and handed to Constantine because he has demanded that his priests wear linen robes during service. <laughs> and everyone just but he usually shakes their head. Who cares what kind of fabric they're wearing? Well, the sting of this is it makes Athanasius look like he's the one making up rules on his own, that he's the rebel, that he's the smart aleck who thinks he knows better than everyone, and that he has somehow ginned up some new rules for priests to follow that have not been agreed upon either in synod or at the imperial level. Constantine buys in enough that Athanasius is a troublemaker, and he calls Athanasius to the court, and he has put relatively under house arrest, meaning he's just sort of held for safekeeping to sort of hope that the fight dies down. This is typical for rulers and politicians throughout most of church history. They don't want to slap things down. They simply want the heat of the problem to subside and then fix it after everyone's cooled off. Over a period of time, though, the accusations against Athanasius are disproved, and Constantine now turns his guns on the Miletians and others and he sends a relatively frustrated letter to them, chiding them for their divisiveness and their fights. Well, in the end, the controversies after Nicaea become quite problematic because there's not just issues related to the ongoing descriptions of the language of the relationship of father and son, but the lack of clarity, frankly, theologically, of the first Nicene symbol or the first Nicene creed caused a number of individuals to have challenges here. And in general, there's two contextual issues that begin to shape a positive reinforcement of the original Nicene Creed and that drives towards the Council of Constantinople in 381. The first is in 362, there is the Council of Alexandria. And at this council, Athanasius is there. And it is here that Athanasius is incredibly helpful because at the Council of Alexandria, they are come together what we have called the Old Nicaeans and the New Nicaeans. And through a period of conversation and relational, frankly, bridge building, both sides come to the conclusion, really through the help of Athanasius, that they affirm the same thing. So 362 is something of a pivot. Now, those who are committed to a pretty strongly anti-Aryan position, even anti-semi-Aryan position, have found common ground and cause together. Now, this is important because this actually is the majority opinion. It's not that after Nicaea, there was all this significant debate and there were dozens of different ideas and no one really agreed and we just had to have councils impose will upon people. The consensus, the majority consensus, the significant majority consensus, was towards homo usias or towards at least the new Nicene position that was pro-Nicaea, but yet concerned about Sabellianism. And so in 362 at this council, the two sides come to common ground, and they're just fine with each other, the way that they use their language to describe the relationship of father and son. However, there steps onto the scene another contextual factor that begins to shape the theological discussion that leads straight into the Council of Constantinople. And that is the rise of the Cappadocian Fathers. Now, the Cappadocians are three of the greatest church fathers. Protestants and evangelicals, of course, don't talk about people being saints per se, not at least in the old medieval sense. But these three folks, the Cappadocians, are some of the most preeminent church fathers of the ancient world. And they are Basil the Great, his brother Gregory of Nyssa, and one of their closest friends, Gregory Nazianzus. And these three men really pick up the charge in, in particular, the Greek-speaking world in helping to clarify repeatedly 
in book after book after book that God is, as they use the language, one usia in three hypostasis, one being in three persons. They write all kinds of books. And, more importantly, they don't simply defend the divinity of the Son, but, since there was now arising some who are questioning the divinity of the Spirit, sensing that attacking the issue of the Father and the Son's relationship was something of a booby trap, some had begun to question the divinity of the Spirit, and, not surprisingly, the Cappadocians come in and say, same issue here. If the Spirit is Lord, if we are baptizing in His name, if we attribute to the Spirit all kinds of things that we only attribute to God, and yet we can speak of the Spirit as a separate something, a separate person, a separate hypostasis, then we have to be careful and apply some of the same limits to our language that we apply to the Son. And the Cappadocians really pick up where Athanasius has left off and carry it further and further to clarifying the Church's position and its language on these issues. And, more importantly, They are instrumental in shaping the Council of Constantinople. And it's that council which we'll look at in our next lecture. Mm